Good morning to those of you joining from uh, uh, from Europe uh, and from elsewhere. I'm very pleased to welcome the panelists and the attendees, as well as those following on YouTube, to the second day of this uh, dissemination workshop of the Project CRISI. Uh, that's the acronym for the Project Competing Regional Integrations in Southeast Asia. Uh, CRISI brings together scholars from 13 different universities and institutes in Europe and Southeast Asia to do interdisciplinary research funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 Framework Program that studies multiple forces affecting regional integration in Southeast Asia and the challenges they present uh, to the peoples of Southeast Asia. Now this workshop is organized by the uh, Center of Strategic and International Studies in Jakarta and I'd like to start by uh, expressing my thanks to everyone at CSIS for the smooth and efficient organization of this event. I know that a lot of very hard work has gone on behind the scenes, so thanks to all of you. The first session of this workshop was held yesterday on one of the main themes of the CRISI project and a perennial issue for all those who study integration in Southeast Asia. The subject of the region, ASEAN's contested centrality. Today we tackle a different and much more recent topic, the pandemic which has for the last year transformed the lives of all of us in so many ways. I would like to take this opportunity uh, to, to thank Thomas Larson, who's our moderator today, uh, and also the convener of the group of uh, crisis scholars who've been studying the coronavirus crisis since we, large, uh, since we launched this research uh, last April, uh, as well as uh, Jacques Leider, the project's uh, scientific coordinator, who's also been following this very closely. Thanks, of course, too, to all of, all of you who are presenting uh, this afternoon, this morning, um, and to uh, those of you who are following and hopefully will be asking questions uh, through the uh, uh, question and answer section on, on, on Zoom or through YouTube. Now, to chair the session on the subject of Southeast Asia and the COVID-19 challenge, I'm delighted to pass the floor now to Thomas Larson. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or whatever would be the appropriate greeting, wherever you are in the world. So the topic for today's discussion is Southeast Asia and the COVID-19 challenge, which um, when we conceived of the CRISI project and started it, obviously didn't think that it would be a topic that we would cover. But for all kinds of reasons, um, the pandemic has been difficult to ignore. And we thought that it would be desirable to try to mobilize our network of scholars in Europe and Southeast Asia um, to extend their research in order to reflect on COVID-19 in light of their uh, interests and expertise. And I'd like to mention that some of the fruits of that intellectual labor um, is available in the form of a series of policy briefs, seven in all, that are available on the CRISI website. But today we then have the privilege, the great privilege of hearing from the scholars uh, who, uh, who have been working on this and, and to join in a discussion about how societies in both maritime and mainland Southeast Asia have responded to the challenges posed by COVID-19. We'll have four presentations followed by comments by three discussants. And then there will be uh, a Q&A session where um, uh, I invite you to post questions 
uh, on Zoom or on YouTube, however you are receiving this. Um, all right, so let's, 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 let's move on quickly to the actual presentations, which will be fairly brief. Each presentation should take around 10 minutes. And I would like to start then by uh, passing the baton to Monica Arnes of the uh, Department of Languages and Cultures of Southeast Asia at the University of Hamburg, who will presenting uh, work that she has done together with Thomas Kaminski uh, of the Department of Asian Studies at the University of Woods. Um, Monica, over to you. Thank you so much for inviting Tomek and, uh, Tomek and me to this workshop and for giving us the opportunity uh, to present our ideas on resilience and the role of city and community initiatives in post-pandemic recovery in selected Southeast Asian countries. So in this case, our examples are taken from Indonesia and the Philippines, two countries that have been hit hard by the COVID-19 crisis. Resilience. Resilience is something that particularly comes to mind in challenging times. Its origins lie in psychology. We tend to refer to a person's resilience when referring to his or her ability to return to some form of normal condition after a period of stress. Yet this term is of course also well known across disciplines. Yesterday, to pick up what uh, Sophie Boisseau said in her introduction to the work of the work package, The Region, posed the question why ASEAN is still resilient, but weak and whether it can remain resilient despite its weaknesses. So today we are going to talk about resilience in relation to COVID-19 and climate change. So here are some preliminary assumptions in, from our policy brief. So the first is that, of course, COVID-19 has disrupted food supply chains. The next is that it has hit vulnerable people particularly hard because they cannot afford good health care. They have difficulty meeting their basic needs due to their low income or unemployment. They suffer from the effects of climate change too. We should keep in mind that four countries in Southeast Asia are among the top 10 countries in the climate risk index in Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, and also um, Myanmar. We expect that the climate crisis will exceed the severe consequences of COVID-19. So here is the question that uh, we pose in our policy brief. How can the resilience of cities and communities facing the dual challenges of COVID-19 recovery and climate change mitigation be strengthened for post-pandemic recovery through the efficient use and dissemination of knowledge? So we take two case studies, one rural and one urban, to have a look at that. So one is transnational city networks that is going to be discussed by my colleague, Tommy Kaminsky, and another one, rural, a local community, the revitalization of rice barns. So here in our introduction to the policy brief, we also refer to the donut model, um, a book, well, th that model is taken from book Donut Economics by Kate Rayworth. Um, in line with the fragility of globalized value, change, value chains, the challenges of food supply caused by COVID-19 in cities. So Professor Kate Rayworth developed this model and accordingly called the book Donut Economics. Without going into details here, the donut consists of an outer ring, the environmental ceiling. It marks the planet's boundary, some of which have been exceeded. Examples in her model are climate change, land conversion, and loss of biodiversity. And then there is an inner ring of the donut, which marks the social foundation based on social, show, uh, social standards as agreed in the sustainable development goals. Examples um, range from food and water to social equity, political voice, peace and prosperity. So in our policy brief, we referred to this model when talking about the circulation of ideas, particularly. Um, Amsterdam being the first city officially applying the donut model. 
the member of the transnational city network C40, Amsterdam is a member of it, published the Amsterdam City Donut in April 2020. And for example, it includes the goal of becoming climate neutral by 2050. And my colleague will refer to the donut model later in his presentation as well. So one case study that I would like to mention here is related to rice barns in uh, Lombok. So here we think that COVID-19 of course poses challenges not only for food security in cities but also for local communities in rural areas. And so the case study I would like to draw on here is taken from Lombok. So basically it is a traditional system of rice storage and consumption. Part of the rice is taken for a short period of time for consumption, another is kept for a seed supply for the next planting season and also in case of disaster or death. So in 2018, an earthquake hit Lombok. Um, for example, in Pendua village in North Lombok, this village had experienced food shortages during this earthquake. As a result, food supplies were insufficient. And for the residents in that village, food supply became a serious problem. In response to this, the residents and together with the Pandua village administration have begun to organize a food system that is more resilient to shocks. This has now also been revitalized in the context of COVID-19 with the village head concluding in April 2020 that food stocks will suffice for the next months. So the, we want to make the point here that self-reliant food systems can be of great importance in Corona times and beyond. Reviving traditional knowledge about crop management, we think, is one way how communities can become more resilient to shocks, including disasters caused by climate change. So this is the point when I would like to hand over to my colleague, Tomek Kaminski. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Monica. Uh, I hope you can see my slides yet. Okay. Uh, I would like to present the, the second case study of our policy brief, so the, the, the city case. Um, it, I think it's a, it's a very important, uh, uh, important problem because COVID is, is mainly a problem of cities. 95% uh, of COVID cases are reported in urban uh, areas and, um, and can COVID also transform uh, cities in, uh, uh, in a form of uh, in, a, in, a, in a three ways, uh, as a, so we can see a digital transfer, transformation in, in cities. We can see a social tra tra transformation, unfortunately, un unfortunately, in form of rising uh, in a, in a inequalities, uh, and we can see also a green transfer transformation, or, or we would like to see a, a green transformation in uh, in our cities. And from the very beginning of the COVID pandemic, transnational cities uh, networks uh, start to discuss um, how to respond, how cities should respond to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the problem, start to learn from each other, start to think how to adapt to the changing uh, uh, situ situ situation and, uh, and the consequences of, uh, of uh, COVID. Uh, the most ambitious response, response from the uh, from the uh, from the cities uh, is the city 40 mayor's statement for a green and just uh, recovery, uh, published uh, 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 last year um, by the mayors uh, of C40. Uh, uh, C40 is the uh, is one of the the cities network uh, that group. Um, the biggest cities in the uh, in the world from from all continents, uh, also from from uh, from Southeast uh, Asia, and the mayors called for COVID stimulus package uh, to found a green uh, a green recovery of uh, or in cities. 
And this uh, agenda is, uh, is very ambitious, maybe even over ambitious. Uh, they want to create millions of jobs. Um, they want to prevent uh, premature deaths in, in, in the next 10 years by tackling uh, air pollution. Um, they want to employ uh, this um, uh, very innovative donut model uh, um, uh, that, that Monica shortly uh, described. Uh, but in the nutshell, this, uh, this model want to uh, change the way we think about development. Um, uh, we should not concentrate that much on the GDP growth, uh, but rather on, uh, on the well-being of uh, of people and uh, and our and our planet. By the way, it, it's by far the the, the most thought-provoking book I I've read last year, and uh, I can hi uh, highly recommend it to uh, to you. Uh, in our policy brief, we uh, we of course uh, uh, try to uh, think how uh, those activities, though um, those ambitious plan can be applied in, in Southeast Asian cities. And we think about uh, three problems, uh, or we see three, three, three problems here. The first is the problem of uh, capacity uh, bottlenecks. So uh, the management of city or uh, in cities or mobilization of public sector resources, or maybe the lack of the, the uh, leadership skills could hinder uh, the implementation of uh, very ambitious recovery uh, recovery plans planned uh, by those uh, transnational city networks. The second problem is with uh, the synergy or rather lack of synergy with national recovery uh, plans. Uh, so far, the Asian governments have made only limited choices to use green elements in, in recovery plans on the national, on the national level. Uh, and the third obstacle is uh, related uh, uh, with the networks uh, themselves. So the, uh, the lack of support um, uh, uh, to uh, enable a real transfer of knowledge from the network to a specific city. The networks usually organize webinars, uh, they produce political statements, but it might be not enough uh, to to bring a, a, a real change, and the technical and financial support is um, uh, is needed. And to conclude, uh, recovery uh, is widely seen as an opportunity, and we think that should be seen. It should be seen as an opportunity to step up efforts to mitigate climate change, to uh, promote uh, equity and sustainable development and advocates of such uh, actions like for example European Union should consider closer co cooperation with non-state actors such as the cities or local co co communities to facilitate uh, uh, knowledge transfer. In terms of the, of the EU it is the, uh, the challenge to um, open a new channels of communication, direct communication with uh, with non-state actors like cities or, or local co co communities. Usually European Union uh, cooperate with, uh, with states uh, and, and the government. And in, uh, in this case, it's definitely not, uh, not enough. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we, we can uh, point out a number of examples of very interesting initiatives in Southeast Asian cities and local co co communities that deserve attention uh, and can be perceived as, uh, as knowledge producers uh, that are able to, to share their solutions with peers around, uh, around the world. Therefore, um, UN agencies, uh, NGOs around the world, European, European Union should seek uh, uh, or uh, should try to identify uh, those uh, initiatives um, uh, that can contribute to green recovery model that is uh, that is promoted by the, by those uh, by those uh, or organization. I will stop here. I think uh, our time our time is is finished. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Monica and Tomas. So we move on to our second presentation, uh, remaining in Maritime Southeast Asia. And we turn to Philips Vermonte from CSIS Indonesia to speak on Indonesia's response to COVID-19. Please, Philips. Thank you, <clears throat> Thomas. Um, may I uh, share <clears throat> my slide? Hold on. Uh, Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, in the next few minutes, uh, <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm going to describe uh, Indonesia's response to COVID-19. And uh, first of all, of course, I would like to thank the organizer, my colleague uh, at CSIS, Medelina and others, and as well as uh, the team at uh, CRISI for inviting me to share some uh, perspective from, from Indonesia regarding the, the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> um, of course, uh, as we know, uh, this is not actually uh, unique to Indonesia that uh, COVID-19 exposes so many vulnerabilities in various aspects of governance. Uh, <clears throat> and then the, for Indonesia specifically, I think uh, there are problems in decision-making uh, given the size of the country, uh, cultural diversity, religion, uh, beliefs, and so on and so forth that uh, affect the way the government uh, communicated with people as well as how people responded to, to, to the government initiatives in, in, in dealing with the pandemic. And then secondly, <clears throat> uh, problem of uh, the institutions and then the, the dilemma, uh, not only in Indonesia, I think in, in so many other countries, dilemma between uh, health and economics, uh, the concern about uh, if uh, you impose too many uh, too strict uh, regulations, then the, economics, uh, the economy will be halted and so on. So uh, uh, since uh, the pandemic uh, hit Indonesia back in, in February, first case was reported in March uh, 2nd uh, last year, this dilemma has been going on <clears throat> up until uh, today as we speak. And then the, uh, thirdly, uh, there's another problem uh, given the, 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 the fact that Indonesia is a developing country. Of course, the health infrastructure is another issue that uh, you know, affect the way uh, Indonesia responds. And then uh, lastly, uh, about the economic recovery, which is uh, very important as well for emerging economy like Indonesia. Now, <clears throat> just to start, uh, the facts and figures in Indonesia for COVID-19, uh, as you see, we have not yet uh, been able to flatten the curve uh, since uh, February last year up until today. Uh, new cases uh, keep uh, going up, and then the, especially uh, in the in the in the past few days, uh, I'll return to this uh, data later. And then the <clears throat> uh, and daily new cases as well, as you see from the graph on the on the right uh, hand side, uh, keep going up. And then the, uh, compared to other countries, uh, probably in Southeast Asia, Indonesia seems not to be able yet to flatten the curve. And then uh, as of uh, today, uh, you see uh, it's, it's picking up uh, again. Uh, active cases uh, keep going up. And then the, the death uh, number, the number of people uh, that from coronavirus also keep, has been keeping, uh, has been increasing uh, in the past uh, few weeks. And then the, I'll, I'll, I'll explain later why is it, uh, you know, uh, that Indonesia has not been able to, uh, to tackle the, the pandemic quite properly. Now, <clears throat> I think uh, for the first uh, factor about the decision-making, uh, uh, it has to be acknowledged that uh, uh, we uh, respond quite slowly in the beginning, uh, denial uh, can be felt. And then the, after that, when the number of cases, number of death increased, uh, we, we, we've seen a half-hearted policy. Uh, for example, uh, you know, the first confirmed case uh, was announced on March 2nd. Uh, then the, the establishment of rapid response team by the government, uh, led by the, uh, the Indonesian uh, Disaster Management Agency, was issued two weeks later. So it's, 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 uh, there, there was this two weeks lag uh, at the time when the number of confirmed cases was already about 70. But then uh, the, the next day, uh, the, the status of non-natural emergency situation was announced and then the, only in one day you already increased uh, by 30 uh, cases, uh, probably more because at the time the, uh, the capacity to do testing of course was very low. 
And then the large scale social restriction was only implemented about a month later. So uh, you see, uh, this is, uh, I think, not, again, not unique to Indonesia, but it affected the way then uh, things unfolded <clears throat> uh, subsequently. And uh, there are uh, big provinces uh, with a big number of cases. And then the, this, uh, I would say, uh, Jakarta is uh, having the, the largest number of cases uh, so far as well as the, uh, the, the second largest, uh, the, the largest province of West Java are, are mostly the, the, with the highest population. Uh, you see, even they just implemented the last scale social restriction uh, more than one month after the first case was announced. Uh, and then uh, even West Java province uh, did that uh, you know, even, uh, even much, much later. Now, the slow and half-hearted policy to implement stronger measures uh, have caused trouble up until today. And uh, it's feasible. Uh, we've seen the flip-flopping decision, for example, to ban annual traveling, uh, because uh, of course, uh, this uh, disease, uh, the pandemic uh, in particular was caused by movement of people. Uh, but uh, exactly at this point, uh, the government seems to be very flip-flopping. Uh, they failed to ban annual traveling uh, this this culture uh, of uh, going to your hometown uh, every every year at the end of fasting month of Ramadan, Christmas, New Year's, and so on and so forth, and it it it, it caused big results of a mixed result of the large scale social restriction that was intended to restrict uh, people's movement, but uh, at the same time it was not followed by a very strict implementation uh, on the ground. Now you see, for example, uh, if I may. Uh, just to remind you to, to kind of uh, summarize the earlier graph that uh, I already uh, showed you. Now, <clears throat> so far, uh, there were uh, more than 5 million people tested, but half of them in, in, in Jakarta, in the capital city. And then we have a 15% uh, uh, positive rate, and then the, the, the positive cases uh, reach a number of almost 800,000 more than 20,000 uh, dead. And then the, sadly, uh, medical workers, the frontliners, uh, there's a substantial number of them who, uh, you know, who died uh, because of, of their work uh, at the front line. So this is the issue that, uh, of course, uh, worries us because uh, this is the highest number uh, actually in Asia. Now, about the exodus, the, the, the failure to restrict uh, people, uh, this is uh, just uh, plotting the graph, uh, the, the annual event that Indonesians uh, always <clears throat> do. Uh, the end of Ramadan holiday, as you see, <clears throat> it was uh, at the end of May 2020. So about two weeks later, you know, the number increased substantially across Indonesia. And, and then uh, you see, there's this uh, kind of a correlation uh, between the, the end of Ramadan, a holiday that people uh, going to went to their hometown with the increased number of uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, two weeks later. This is uh, on the left-hand side, uh, the graph for the Indonesian nationwide, and the right-hand side is uh, for, for Jakarta. And then the, we have a long weekend uh, in October for three days, uh, uh, the end of October, 28 to 31st, uh, and then the two weeks later, uh, you see some increase as well. And then the, you know, and then peak about uh, November 13, exactly two weeks later. And then uh, this kind of a repetitive failure uh, to, to restrict the people movement on a very predicted um, holiday, I think is, is worrisome that uh, we could do much better in, 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 in preventing uh, the, the number of cases uh, increasing. And then the, uh, recently, you know, during the Christmas and New Year's uh, holiday, you know, now even the, uh, almost two weeks later, uh, this is the record number of Indonesia new cases, uh, 9,300 uh, something uh, yesterday, uh, new cases uh, were, were recorded. And the same thing with, with the capital city in Jakarta, uh, you know, follow the, the very similar pattern with the, uh, the, with the, the nationwide data. What I'm saying is that uh, <clears throat> this half-hearted policy, uh, 
although on paper there were uh, so many policies uh, that have been issued, but uh, the implementation on the ground is, <clears throat> I think, uh, very weak. And, and that's why I think it's very difficult for Indonesia to flatten the curve so far. Now, secondly, I think uh, I'm not sure whether it happened uh, in the other countries. Uh, this is not from the US, <laughs> the pictures, this is from Indonesia. And uh, I have to say that politics get in the way. Uh, uh, it it, uh, it complicates the effort to deal with the pandemic because of various political issues that uh, force uh, you know, uh, people uh, to, to go on the street, to, to, to do protests. Uh, essentially, they are ignoring uh, all the protocols, health protocols that uh, you know, should be there to prevent uh, the numbers from increasing. The first picture, this is the return of the, the, the Islamic cleric that was exiled in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he returned uh, in November. And then, uh, you know, this is uh, the airport, uh, international airport uh, in, in Jakarta. And you see uh, people welcome him uh, certainly without a uh, health protocol. And then the, another one, uh, this one uh, from, oops, sorry. The second picture, uh, this is a, a mass demonstrations against the, the law, the, the so-called omnibus law, uh, it, it, a very controversial law uh, that uh, caused students, uh, uh, labor movement, uh, they went on the street, uh, certainly uh, without this uh, health protocol. Uh, there's no way that, uh, you know, a, a government uh, security apparatus to enforce uh, the, the protocol and uh, you might expect that around these uh, dates, you know, numbers are increasing. And then the, uh, the, the last picture is about local election, uh, simultaneous local election that happened in December uh, across uh, hundreds of uh, districts across Indonesia and, and in nine provinces. And then the, you know, uh, campaign and then people are, uh, were going to the polling stations and so on and so forth. So you see, uh, Politics really is something that complicates uh, things in Indonesia because uh, it involves um, uh, mass demonstration. And then the, uh, that's why I think uh, the, the graph that I showed you earlier uh, related to this uh, you know, uh, inability of the government to deal with the politics uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, in a more formal way. And then uh, politics got a very uh, informal that it went on the street instead of uh, uh, in the parliament house. Now, secondly, on the institutional capacity, uh, we have a national disaster mitigation agency, uh, but the institutional setup uh, uh, has been oriented primarily to deal with natural disasters, uh, less on non-natural disasters. So the, the, the learning curve uh, is, is pretty long. And then the, secondly, the problem with this mitigation agency is that it's uh, decentralized in nature, no direct uh, line of command between this uh, agency at the national level and the agency at the local level. And then uh, thirdly, uh, variation of institutional capacity of this agency across the regions of Indonesia. And uh, this is something that also uh, affect <clears throat> the, the ability of the government at the national level as well as the local level to deal with the pandemic quickly. Now on the health infrastructure, this is the data from uh, WHO. <clears throat> you could see that uh, from various score, that uh, Indonesia is reporting to the WHO. Uh, the per capita, for example, per capita total expenditure on health, uh, you know, it's ranked uh, number 81. And then uh, you could see all, all, the, all the data here that Indonesia is a middle uh, of uh, self-reporting uh, mechanism uh, to do WHO. <clears throat> I extract this data and then uh, you see in terms of number, uh, it seems that Indonesia had enough uh, hospital beds, uh, beds uh, you know, uh, during the period of 2014, 2018, two years before uh, the pandemics uh, hit us. <clears throat> but uh, if uh, we look at in terms of uh, per capita, Indonesia is actually has a very, uh, quite a low uh, number. Uh, you know, we only have uh, 1.2 uh, beds per 1,000 people. If you compare it with South Korea, with Italy, with Malaysia, Indonesia is uh, way below. So there's something 
related to the health infrastructure that Indonesia is currently having uh, that needs to be fixed, you know, in order for Indonesia to be able to, to deal with future pandemic. <clears throat> in terms of uh, uh, economic uh, recovery, uh, the government uh, since last year uh, launched a series of economic and fiscal packages uh, to mitigate the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the package uh, reached the amount of uh, Indonesian rupiah uh, 600 uh, or almost 700 uh, trillion rupiah. It's about 4% of, of Indonesia's GDP. Uh, <clears throat> uh, if we break it down, uh, you could see that uh, for healthcare, it's a uh, healthcare actually. Uh, if you look at the the, the distribution of this uh, uh, economic package, uh, health uh, certainly is down uh, is below uh, you know in in terms of the amount of money below uh, the number that uh, was prepared for the economic side. You know, for social protection, uh, the government allocated 1.2% of the GDP from sectoral and uh, subnational government spending, 0.7% uh, uh, of the Indonesian GDP, support for the <clears throat> small medium enterprises, 0.8% uh, uh, of the GDP, financing for co corporation, 0.3% uh, of the GDP, tax incentive for firms, 0.7% uh, of the GDP. So most of the uh, package uh, allocated were actually on the economy. So you see the government in the beginning, uh, probably for the whole year of 2020, tilted more towards dealing with the economy. And then uh, seems to me that the government, and this is normal, I think all governments, uh, all governments are betting on uh, the availability of vaccine. And then for 2021, uh, the government of Indonesia allocated uh, 74 trillion uh, Indonesian rupiah for, for vaccine. So <clears throat> the stimulus package is there, uh, but the implementation is probably another issue. But uh, I'm, I'm no economist, probably, uh, you know, the commentators later can uh, also deal with this. I think <clears throat> uh, that's all uh, for me. Uh, essentially, I'm, I'm saying that uh, it, it's hard for Indonesia so far to deal with this uh, pandemic. Uh, we have not yet to be able to flatten the curve, uh, although, uh, and the government seems to be <clears throat> tilted more towards the economy, while uh, what we need is a uh, balance between the two. Uh, back to you, uh, moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philips, um, uh, for that information-rich presentation. Uh, for our uh, next uh, presentation, we turn to colleagues based in Hanoi. Uh, Do Ta Khan from the Vietnam Academy of Social Sciences and Andrew Hardy of the EFEO, who will speak on Vietnam's response to COVID-19. Um, I don't know which one of you wants to go first. Uh, I, I will. I will speak first, Thomas. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Thomas. Um, I will. I will. Uh, we will be presenting research uh, conducted by a team of uh, seven Vietnamese and European scholars, uh, including Arve Hansen, Phạm Quỳnh Phương, Melody Shum, uh, Sigrid Vertheim Heck, and Vũ Ngoc Quyên, um, to talk about. Vietnam's response to COVID-19. I will start by giving an overview of the situation in Vietnam, and then I will hand over to Do Ta Khang of the Vietnam Academy of Social Sciences, uh, who will present a more in-depth case study. So first, some uh, basic data. Vietnam is a country of nearly 100 million people with close relations and a long border with China. After uh, infected persons arrived from Wuhan, Vietnam's first case tested positive for COVID-19 on the 23rd of January, 2020. And since then, the country has suppressed four waves of the virus. The first was in late February, and this saw a few dozen infections. The second uh, in March and April, 
saw over 100 local infections. The third in July and August uh, centered on Da Nang. This saw over 500 local infections. And a fourth very short outbreak in Ho Chi Minh City last month, which was quickly contained. To date, Vietnam has seen a total of 1,500 people infected with COVID-19, including imported cases and 35 deaths. So what explains this achievement? Our research identified three crucial factors. One was the government's uh, political leadership and mobilization. The second was the government's strategy of targeted containment. And the third was the high level of trust from society achieved by the government during the crisis. So I'll go through these three factors in turn. In factor one, the government gave strong, timely political leadership. The key to this were three things. Uh, first, that the government's pre-pandemic planning for and understanding of the pandemic on the basis of the experience of SARS and avian flu since 2003. Two was the speed of the response, which was very fast. And three was the effectiveness of the political mobilization, uh, particularly the relationship between the central government and local authorities. The rapid response was made possible by the existence of pre-existing operational plans. Prioritization of the population's health over economic and other imperatives showed the government's understanding of the pandemic's potential for destruction. And this in turn contributed to the strong mobilization. There was no prioritization of the economic or even balancing of the economic. Here there was no dilemma. The administration's chain of command allowed uh, the pandemic prevention policies to reach the whole of society very quickly. But this was not just a top-down response. Province and city authorities enjoyed autonomy to design responses appropriate to local conditions. And cooperation between central and local government has been a hallmark of Vietnam's political mobilization against COVID-19. In fact, to two, the government implemented a targeted containment strategy. It did this by rigorously isolating hotspot locations and exposed individuals. Locations were locked down, while individuals were ranked on the Ministry of Health's F system. Now, the F system does two things. It uses contact tracing to categorize people by proximity to a case of COVID-19. And secondly, it uses those categories to apply appropriate quarantine regimes. Thus, people testing positive for COVID-19 are classified as F0. Cont Contacts of an F0 are classified as F1. Contacts of an F1 are F2. And three more risk levels, F3, F4, and F5, are identified in the same way. Now, the F system works on a targeting principle, allowing implementation of quarantine regimes, either at home or in dedicated facilities or in hospital. And those regimes are appropriate to individuals' epidemi epidemiological status, which is established through testing and contact tracing. And I think the key point about the F system is that it allows a hierarchization of the risk, uh, not just 
careful isolating of people who have the disease, but also people who have might who might have the disease as a result of their contacts and their contacts, contacts, and their contacts, contacts, contacts. This containment strategy led to the quarantining of around 200,000 people in January through to April. And it led to targeting local lockdowns of uh, several villages, urban wards, hospitals, and a whole city. But a national lockdown that only lasted for two weeks, the first two weeks in April. Now we move on to factor three. The government achieved a high level of trust from society. This was thanks to the population's prior experience of epidemics since 2003, the communitarian characteristics of Vietnamese society when faced with crises, and a calculated state strategy of social engagement. To achieve this trust, the government used several trust creation strategies. And I summarize, summarize these very briefly. There was a strategy of decision-making, transparency, and clear communications. From the outset, the public was kept informed through press briefings, text messaging, social media. After some initial skepticism, people saw that information from official outlets was transparent and reliable. Nationalist and wartime discourse was also deployed to mobilize public sentiment. The General Secretary of the Communist Party's call to the nation uh, before the national lockdown also reminded the Vietnamese of their wartime past and the challenges of that struggle. And this was in a sense, the party declaring war on the virus. This was very powerful in, in, in the Vietnamese uh, public mind. Secondly, there was an economic strategy. The prime minister repeatedly stated, we are willing to sacrifice short-term economic interests in order to protect people's health and lives. The early decision to close the border with China showed the government's abandonment of its normal priority of economic growth in order to safeguard public health. And I think this moved people very deeply. Finally, there was a cultural strategy whereby the government leveraged communitarian features in Vietnamese society, where community values are treasured, perhaps not always in daily life, but certainly at times of crisis. So to conclude, the pandemic was an ideal opportunity for the Communist Party to reinforce its legitimacy. And it has seized that opportunity very effectively. We can talk in terms of a COVID-19 dividend here. It remains to be seen whether this governance style will continue beyond the crisis into normal times as well. And this point about crisis about Vietnam in what we call a crisis mode underpins the main conclusion to our research, the main sort of general conclusion, I should say. Uh, COVID-19 was suppressed here thanks to a proactive leadership which implemented an effective containment policy uh, and engaged sensitively with society. But this policy would not have succeeded without the response it received from a population that was culturally prepared for crisis. As one woman noted, uh, in everyday Vietnamese society, there are many problems, but at times of crisis, we look after each other. And so the COVID uh, uh, crisis has been revealing certainly of normal times, but especially of how uh, the Vietnamese respond to crisis. Crisis also had the effect of suspending the ambient disorder that pervades the Vietnamese population in the form of unruliness and disobedience, 
and the state in the form of corruption. It motivated everyone to behave with discipline and respect for the rules uh, during the crisis period. And this suspended disorder is certainly a feature of Vietnam's crisis mode. So that, those are my general remarks uh, and the summary of our research on the uh, general situation in Vietnam. I, I, I'm now uh, happy to hand over to Dr. Kheng, uh, who will present the results of his case study. Thanks, Kheng. I will share my screen. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew, for uh, allowing me to have a chance to present on the, our film research uh, finding on the impact of COVID-19 on the industrial workers that we uh, we don't know that it, 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 uh, uh, because because we, we conduct a, a big uh, a field work on industrial workers in the middle of night, uh, 2019. Uh, we, uh, we, we try to uh, interview about 3,000 workers around Vietnam on their life uh, and uh, working conditions. Uh, but then we 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 uh, we already conduct uh, the, our research in the north and the central Vietnam in 2019, and when and then we get stuck with uh, the 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 COVID-19 when it came to Vietnam uh, early 2020. So uh, we both won our uh, research until uh, May uh, 2020 when we uh, stopped. Uh, Social distancing because we 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 take we took about three weeks for social distancing uh, in 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 April, uh, and 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 uh, so in early May we uh, we uh, resume our uh, research again and we uh, we asked uh, about uh, fifty questions more on the questionnaire on the, uh, how the, the COVID nineteen impact on the workers, and uh, today I I I mean. Uh, uh, because we we don't have much time, so I just talk about how the COVID nineteen impact on the income of industrial workers who are working uh, in the industrial zone in Vietnam. And here we will uh, talk about the impact on, on industrial workers in the south of Vietnam. Uh, um, our, our, our our research uh, we we employ uh, both quantitative. Uh, uh, method and qualitative methods. Uh, it means that uh, we use the questionnaire uh, uh, by using the software Question Bro, uh, which uh, about uh, 200 uh, questions uh, for, 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 for the quantitative research. And we also have a list of uh, semi-structure questionnaire uh, for qualitative uh, by using uh, in-depth interviews, uh, mostly by uh, the live history of, of the workers. Uh, we uh, we we choose uh, three industrial zones in the south of Vietnam: one in Ho Chi Minh City, and one in Đồng Nai, and one in uh, Tây Ninh provinces. Uh, here is a uh, it's a for geographical uh, proximity because Ho Chi Minh City, as you know, that it's a major uh, city uh, urban in, in 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 Vietnam. It's it's the largest city in, in in Vietnam and in the south. Why uh, in the meanwhile, Đồng Nai it's closer to Ho Chi Minh City and uh, further is the Tây Ninh provinces. Uh, it took uh, us uh, almost uh, two weeks uh, to to finish with uh, uh, more uh, nearly uh, one thousand to hundred workers uh, were uh, in in both in two sector uh, in two key sector in 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 in, in the industrial zone, garment and electronic. And we also try to uh, interview uh, a trade union officer also for to to ask for the students and the workers that they are uh, represent for. Uh, and here is a, I will go uh, 
here is some definition that in our research, we will ask the workers to define their, uh, here is, we mentioned about the income. Uh, uh, before February uh, 2020, it means that before the COVID-19 uh, and after COVID, it means that uh, we asked about the, the income of workers uh, in April, it's the, the month prior to our uh, uh, research, the month we, we, we conduct the research in, in May. Um, also, it's, it's very significant because in, in April, it's, it's a month for social distancing. Uh, in that month in Vietnam, uh, all the uh, society stuff, but industrial workers can go, could go to, to, to work in the industrial zone. This, this is, they still, uh, still work. So, so that we, we want to uh, investigate how, uh, how the, the chain is in, in, in the income. Uh, here, I, I, I said mention of income, but in fact, we, uh, we, we mentioned many other factors in, in, in our research. We will publish uh, gradually, uh, maybe under the, the for, in the form of the working paper on the YC website in the coming months, so we can, you can, you can read it. Um, for here, just some key finding. Uh, the first, the income of the workers decreased uh, considerably. Uh, before, before the COVID, the group of income from 70 million to 80 million it, it was dominant. Uh, it means uh, per year, here it's a per year. Uh, it, 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 it about um, uh, 5,000 uh, euros. I can, can, can convert to euros so it's it easier for you to understand. Uh, but uh, in, in, in April, it means that after the attack of COVID, uh, the dominant group is it, it from the 60 to 70 uh, million per year. So, so it, about more than 10% uh, of the uh, income decrease in income. Uh, in the meanwhile, the high, the high uh, income group uh, of more than 2 million per year, it means that about uh, 7,000 or 8,000 uh, euros per year has no change. So, so you can see here you, you, you can see that uh, the, the the chain in the income uh, before and, and after COVID. You can see you can see the the, the red uh, is uh, before the COVID. You can see that most of, of the of the people have the income in the group of 70, uh, 70 million to eighty uh, million. But after this, uh, uh, after the COVID. Uh, it's it much lower and, and more people in, in, in the group, even, even in the group uh, uh, lower than 50 uh, millions per year. Uh, also, uh, the, the second uh, finding is that uh, the, the worker in the government sector suffer uh, the, loss, the loss in the income more than in the electronic sector. Uh, and you may know that uh, for Vietnam, here in, in I, I should explain that in our research, we just selected uh, the enterprise in, in FBI sector, it means the foreign direct investment sector. And for the port sector, is the export oriented. Most of the, of the, of the uh, product produced by uh, the government and uh, electronic sector. Uh, in FBI sector is for import, uh, yeah, most of them for import, and and we can we can see that also in 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 garment sector, uh, most of the uh, garment sector they employ uh, more uh, lower educated uh, people than in the electronic sector, uh, and for the for garment sector it 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 it's uh, uh, how to say it's it. it in, in the South of Vietnam, it accounts for a lack of position than electric, electric sector because the hub for the government sector is in the South, while electric sector is in the North. Um, but we, 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 we don't have a chance to, to explore in the North, but, uh, but here we, uh, we, we also found uh, uh, some uh, lack of uh, electronic uh, uh, enterprise in the, in the South, and, but, but, and, and it enough to represent the, the sector here. Um, here we can see the, 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 the change in the income of the government sector before and, and after COVID. You can see that very clearly. 
Uh, and here is a, is a change in for the electric sector. You also can see that the, the move uh, the, after the COVID-19, the, the, the majority uh, group of income move forward to, uh, to, to lower group, to lower income. And uh, for in terms of gender, uh, both female, male and female uh, experience uh, the loss uh, in, in their income, but uh, female workers uh, experience uh, the more uh, uh, the degree, the more degree in, 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 in the income. Uh, uh, we can see that the group of the people who, who earn uh, less than 50 million per year increase uh, in, 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 in female uh, workers. Uh, here we also, I also have to explain that uh, uh, the female workers is dominant among the sample of the, of the research. Because uh, in garment sector and electricity electric sector, uh, about 80% of, of workers are female workers. And often they are direct workers. It means that they, they, they work on the assembly uh, uh, chain and also in, 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 in the production chain. Why uh, male workers often they work at technician in, in, in the factory. Uh, so so, so that's why it's also, it, explain why the uh, female workers uh, have experienced uh, more uh, uh, higher rates of, of, uh, of income decrease than, 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 than male, because the male, they are technicians, so it, it just dissolved, it, it somehow is more uh, stable than, than female workers. Um, and, and here it's, uh, it's, it's a change in the income by, by sender before and after the attack of COVID. And the other the, the finding uh, that uh, we also investigate about the, the impact of COVID on uh, the income of uh, workers by tie of labor co uh, contract. Because in life, tie of labor contract, why it matter? Because in, in Vietnam, in Vietnam, there are uh, often two, two tie, two popular tie of uh, uh, tie of contract, labor contract. The first is uh, the five term contract. And the second, undefined term contract. For the defined term contract, that of, often for fast worker, when they when they go to the to, to work for the for enterprise, often first they will sign, they will sign two defined term contract. It means that one year or two year or three year contract, and and then after two uh, defined term contract, it will be automatically uh, becomes undefined term contract. And for the workers who have a, a defined term contract, they will have a more benefits than defined term one. And and also it 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 uh, it's uh, it's uh, difficult to after the law it it more difficult to to find a worker with the undefined term contract. Uh, but in 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 fact uh, here I, I tell you a little bit more that uh, during the uh, in in our in in the interview we also found uh, a lot of unemployed temporary and un un unemployed workers. Uh, it means that they they are they are fired from from their position and they they still live in the dormitory in in the industrial zone to uh, to fight uh, the news off, and there are uh, we, we we found that uh, it 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 not uh, it not true hundred percent that uh, undefined term contract is uh, more difficult to to be fired. In 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 fact, they are uh, the enterprise they. Uh, they find um, they they find the worker uh, on on two strategy. At first, they will find the worker they dismiss the, the worker with short term with the uh, with the, the fixed term contract. It's, uh, often, for example, if the the, the worker sign a uh, one year contract with the enterprise, and, and they have work for the for the enterprise about a three months or four months, they will be fired first. And the sec the second the second uh, uh, it. they would find the undefined term contract with very high seniority. Uh, it means that they did work for the enterprise for, for, for a long time. Why they, they find those uh, uh, workers? Because uh, the, the more, the more, uh, the highest seniority uh, for, to work for the, the, for, uh, the enterprise, the, uh, the workers, the, the, the enterprise will have to pay more bonus 
uh, often uh, one year for obscenity, they will receive about uh, three or five euros of, uh, per month. Uh, so, so that by by five, it missing uh, 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 the work, the work of the highest uh, sensitivity, the enterprise may reduce their the cost. Um, here you can see uh, the, the impact of uh, uh, COVID nineteen on uh, labor uh, tie of labor contract uh, before. Uh, and, Khan, may I ask you to to conclude rather quickly now? We're running out of time here. Okay, uh, so and also by the education for the worker with uh, lower uh, uh, qualification degree, like a second degree school, they will suffer more than uh, the worker with uh, with with a higher degree, for example, college or, or university. Because often worker with college or university, they will be the for example, the leader of the of, of the team, for example. So uh, they still they can keep their their, their job and 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 salary. Uh, here's some some of my uh, conclusion. Uh, that uh, the first uh, it's uh, COVID nineteen had impact uh, on the industrial workers, uh, with uh, regardless to uh, to to the gender. But female workers uh, suffer more than than male workers, and also. Uh, for the tie of, uh, of uh, a labor contracts, so we can see that all type labor contract uh, reduce the decrease, uh, and and for the education that the lower degree degree will suffer higher risk. Yeah, and, and the reason that in the reason here is it, 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 it our finding that they they have less work than before, than before because of the enterprise. Uh, at, 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 in in uh, in May, uh, some of the uh, so at the break, we get a report that they, they, they didn't have uh, the order for for the last month of the year uh, for the last month of the year, and also and so that also that the overtime work was for in, in for industrial workers overtime uh, work uh, we bring them uh, more so is in, in, in income, but during the, the, the after COVID nineteen uh, attack, uh, they, they don't have uh, overtime work anymore. So. Yeah, it's my presentation. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much. Uh, without uh, further delay, we then move on to the final presentation uh, for this session. Um, and I invite Volker Grabowski from the Department of Languages and Cultures of Southeast Asia at the University of Hamburg to illuminate us with regards to Cambodia's response to COVID-19. Volker? Yeah. I now go, sorry, if I go to my PowerPoint and hope it will work. Yes, fine. Uh, dear colleagues, distinguished guests, uh, my presentation on Cambodia's response uh, to COVID-19 heavily uh, depends on research carried out by my Cambodian PhD student, Bong Bikde Borami, who unfortunately cannot join our workshop today, but uh, to whom I'm very much indebted. How did uh, the government of the Kingdom of Cambodia, one of the poorest countries in Southeast Asia, manage to get the COVID-19 pandemic under control? After an initially lax approach to the impending public health crisis, the authorities in Phnom Penh uh, took quite drastic measures by March 2020 such as the closure of borders uh, with the neighbors, quarantine requirements, uh, lockdowns and public campaign to promote strict hygiene standards and changes of social behavior. As of 5th January this year, only 385 COVID-19 cases were reported of whom 23 are currently active and there have been luckily no deaths reported so far. What strategies were implied and which resources were utilized to deal with the impact of COVID-19 on public health, the society and the economy? Then the other question, how does COVID-19 influence the inter-ethnic and inter-religious relationships in the country? What impact has the pandemic on the political leverage of the opposition and uh, human rights groups which are accused by the Hun Sen government of political opportunism and inciting social unrest? 
in spite of the relatively small number of registered cases, the Cambodian economy has been severely hit by the pandemic. After several years of sustained um, economic growth with the GDP uh, growth rates um, of more than 7%, as you see here, the economy contracted last year by 2%. Most of the contraction has affected the service sector since the coronavirus has wreaked havoc on the country's tourism industry. Note that before the outbreak of the pandemic and restrictions for international travels and tourism, um, this sector contributed um, roughly to one third of uh, Cambodia's GDP. Besides also 170,000 or almost 200,000 workers in the manufacturing industry were at least temporarily affected after the suspension and the closure of their factories, while almost 100,000 laid off migrant workers out of um, 600 to 700,000 returned from Thailand unemployed. Many people who ha have maintained the jobs have seen their salaries cut by 30 to 50 percent, which is quite substantial. The salary cuts and the loss of jobs make it difficult for many people to pay for the microfinance uh, or bank loans. It is predicted that the poverty rate in Cambodia will increase from 10 to almost 20%, while the unemployment rate will rise from less than one to roughly 5% in the post COVID-19 period. To overcome all these problems, the government uses more foreign reserves and uh, plans to borrow around 2 billion US dollars from its uh, development partners to fill shortages for the national budgets of 2020 and uh, this year. This will add up to Cambodia's existing public debt of approximately $13 billion, equal to around 23% of uh, the country's GDP. Theravada Buddhism is the religion of the vast majority of Cambodians, more than 80%. Given Buddhism's vital role in nearly all aspects of life of the Khmer people, Buddhist monks are invited to preside over all ceremonies with the belief that their presence and Dhamma recitation will ensure auspiciousness. Acknowledging their influence, the Cambodian government seeks the cooperation of monks to eliminate fear and educate people to be more protective of COVID-19. Through the initiative of the Supreme Patriarch of Cambodia, on the 16th March of 2020, so at the beginning of the crisis, monks of all monasteries were implore to ring uh, the temple bell to chant the barita, these are apotropaic chantings, and meditate. Aside from strengthening the determination of the people not to be scared of COVID-19, the monks were also asked to join the educational campaign either by disseminating the government anti-COVID-19 guidelines or teaching people about COVID-19 and proper protection measures. According to the guidelines of the World Health Organization to curb the spread of COVID-19, the wearing of face masks and the keeping of social distance are required for all people. To deal with this issue, Prime Minister Hun Sin started to promote the use of the Kroma, the multifunctional Khmer scarf and the Sompir, a greeting by placing the hands palm against palm and raising them to the face or forehead to pay respect, very similar to the Thai and Lao Wai. Slogans like, a Kroma is better than a mask and let's use a Kroma to prevent the COVID-19 virus instead of wearing a face mask as a contribution to promoting national identity and creating jobs for the Cambodian people became the rhetoric of the Cambodian government. This provided the image that the government supports local products thereby simultaneously instilling a sense of national pride. During the graduation day at the Vanda Accounting Institute in Phnom Penh, Prime Minister Hun Sen even vowed to wear a grandma until the end of the pandemic. Later, the Prime Minister found out that uh, some business uh, people also designed a mask made of cotton and with a pattern resembling a grandma. This fashionable mask was propagated with the slogan, grandma mask, Khmer mask. Hun Sen argued that the grandma were cheaper and ensured a better circulation of breath than normal face masks. Thereafter, many Cambodians, both local and uh, overseas, NGOs and provincial authorities in particular, started to order this 
Kromar mask, Khmer mask for distribution in the provinces. The Sompeach was also recommended by Prime Minister Hun Sin to the Cambodian people as the most appropriate way to maintain social distance. This formal greeting, you see here former American President Obama using the Sompeach greeting Hun Sin's wife during his visit in Phnom Penh in 2020, or 2019, sorry. Greet each other by expressing differences with regard to one's own age and social position. It is taught in public schools as a feature of Cambodian cultural identity. However, mainly because of Western influence, but also the legacy of communist regimes in the past, some people, especially those living in urban areas, prefer to greet each other by handshaking. Even Hun Sin enjoys people shaking his hand and hugging him uh, during his visits in the provinces as such gestures demonstrate intimacy like that between a father and his uh, children relationship. However, this no longer works since the outbreak of COVID-19, with handshaking being considered as one of the ways through which the coronavirus can be transmitted. Therefore, Prime Minister Hun Sen turned to the Sobeach for greeting people during his provincial visits and suggested his officials and people to follow his example. Similar strategies are also used with regard to the Cham and Malay, who form around 4 to 5 percent of the population and are called Khmer Islam. Where a group of Khmer Islam had been infected with the COVID-19 during a religious pilgrimage to Malaysia, and some of them had tried to escape from the quarantine requirements, accusations were exchanged on Facebook. Um, some Cambodians even stopped selling to and buying from Khmer Islam, avoiding closer contact with the, uh, the Islamic communities. To reinforce interfaith and religious harmony, Hun Sin condemned the discrimination of Jam and Malay and emphasized how he cared for and respected Islam, calling for a cooperation of the Khmer Islam with the government. Through Muslim officials, uh, and their media networks, the Cambodian government also successfully convinced the Jam to pray from home and not at the mosque and refrain from traveling to distant and risky places. The Islamic information of Cambodia, a news outlet of the Muslim community, not only distributed all the government guidelines for Muslims to protect themselves from COVID-19, but also persuaded all Muslims who respect, suspected um, that uh, they uh, might have been infected to get a coronavirus test or a medical treatment only at the government authorized hospitals and by medical specialists. Otherwise, the argument uh, went on, this will uh, be against uh, the teachings of Islam. It even cited the prophet Muhammad, as you see here on the slide, that someone who provides treatment without medical knowledge and practice should be held responsible if such treatment had caused danger to patients. And also there was, a, that I will not go here into detail, um, uh, encouragement of uh, representatives of the Christian community also uh, to help the government in uh, propagating hygiene uh, standards. Aside from the three main religions, some local traditions were tolerated by the government during the COVID-19 pandemic. For instance, some Cambodians in the countryside put uh, the Ding Mong or the uh, scarecrows uh, on the front gates to ward off the virus. The scarecrows are dressed like humans but have a scary face and even wear some weapons. People believe that whenever the evil spirits bringing the coronavirus pass their house entrance and see the scarecrow, they do not dare to enter the building but run away. This practice can be traced back to traditional animistic beliefs um, uh, and uh, that were then gradually integrated into the Cambodian Buddhism, placed in front of the gates of temples and pagodas, mythological animals such as lions or augurs are expected to protect such sacred places. The pandemic provides uh, the government in Phnom Penh a welcome opportunity to promulgate laws that otherwise might have been uh, more difficult to implement in pre-COVID-19 times. Throughout 2020, human rights organizations registered numerous unprovoked attacks and crackdowns on political actors and activists. In the first uh, weeks after the pandemic's outbreak alone, more than 30 people, among them opposition activists, social media users and journalists were arrested, being accused of disseminating so-called fake news about the COVID-19 pandemic. The government 
therefore considers those who spread fake news during the COVID-19 pandemic to be terrorists, unlike normal criminals. To take, uh, to take one example, uh, Sivan Riti, uh, director of the digital media network, television Facebook, uh, was arrested in April 2020 when he reported that Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sin suggested that motor taxi drivers should sell their motorbikes to deal with the economic difficulties since the government had no financial aid for them. So Riti, later released in October 2020, was charged with inciting chaos and jeopardizing social security. It is widely believed that the enforcement of the decree is more or less uh, aiming at targeting members and activists of the dissolved Cambodian National Rescue Party. Here you see the leaders, Kem Sokka and uh, Sam Rangsi. Mm. The trial against um, uh, the, uh, the former leader, uh, Kim so Ka, has been suspended uh, due to COVID-19, but he remains under court-imposed restrictions. After May 20, uh, 2020, opposition leader Sam Rangsi appealed through his Facebook page uh, to his fellow Cambodians who refused to pay back the loans from banks and microfinanciers uh, until they would get the jobs back. Prime Minister Hun Sin characterized this action as an incitement of social unrest and issued the decree that all appropriate measures be taken to encourage the repayment of loans and to seize the property of those who supported uh, the opposition leader's appeal. Gareth Evans, former Australian foreign minister and one of the architects of the Paris Peace Agreement of October 1991, criticized the Cambodian government of using COVID-19 as a pretext to silence the political opposition. In 2020, um, the Fundamental Freedoms Monitoring Project came to the conclusion that self-censorship in Cambodia has increased to the highest levels ever reported. Compared to many other countries, Cambodia has so far been spared the most destructive impacts uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic, even though its public health care system is still underdeveloped, especially when compared to Vietnam, uh, but also to Thailand. Aside from providing larger salaries and incentives to the medical staff and the improvement of the target uh, uh, hospital and quarantine services, the government also made it clear that it understands the different views of COVID-19 among various ethnic and religious groups and uses the agents and networks of each group to explain and gain popular support for the implementation of its guidelines. The contested geopolitics between China and the West became more serious in Cambodia during the COVID-19 crisis. In addition to Cambodia's dependency on Chinese direct investments, loans and tourism, and China's friendly political approach towards the Cambodian government, the donation of medicine, medical staff, and the promised anti-COVID-19 vaccines has made Cambodia lean more on China than the US and the European Union. The Cambodian government uh, quite often perceives uh, that the US and the EU interfere in the country's internal political affairs, supporting the opposition, and that their assistance is given under the condition that the Cambodian government restores the dissolved opposition party and follows Western concepts of democratization and human rights. However, the Cambodian government we should be careful with China as well, but instead try to balance its relations with China and the West since Cambodia still depends on Western tourism and investment and a market in the EU and US, which still counts for around one half of the country's exports of manufacturing goods. Um, I think time is almost running out and I will stop here my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Volker. Uh, and with that, I think we should extend a round of virtual applause for our speakers for their information rich and thought provoking presentations. Uh, we will soon turn towards a Q&A session and you can post questions through Zoom or YouTube. Uh, but before that, some uh, brief uh, com comments from our three discussants. Um, and I turn first to Habib Tsakwan from the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Indonesia. Please go ahead. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, so 
I would like to address a presentation being made by Dr. Arnes and also Dr. Kaminsky first. Uh, I got four couple uh, four four points actually. First one, I think I would like to appreciate uh, the uh, the case studies um, choose, chosen by uh, Dr. Arnes and also Dr. Kaminsky, Indonesia and the Philippines. I think both countries possess uh, a lot of similarities. Uh, both are the, um, both possess the highest cases, the COVID-19 cases uh, in the region, and also similar characteristics such as um, both of them are archipelagic nations, disaster-prone regions, uh, and also they, they, they use a top-down approaches in dealing with the COVID and not to mention about the level of religiousness uh, of the people. Uh, however, I think um, one thing that I, I, I don't know whether I'm the one who missed the presentation, but I haven't really heard about the Philippines, uh, the, the Philippine stories uh, discussed by, by both of you. Second one, I think I'd like to also appreciate um, both of you um, because uh, taking into account the climate change as another uh, factor uh, when we, we do the recovery after the pandemic. Uh, however, I, I think not only climate change that is important, but also disaster management. Yes, climate change is very important for uh, all of us. I mean, around the world, uh, slow onset disasters. Uh, in, in disaster realm, we, we, we mention it as slow onset disasters or hydrometeorological. And in fact, that uh, Southeast Asia is very prone to disasters. Um, uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic, I think uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, and also the Philippines and other uh, countries in the region suffer from both, uh, both threats here. Uh, for example, the Philippines suffer from the Typhoon Phong Phong, and then uh, the v Vietnam, Typhoon Goni, and so on and so forth, Indonesia. Uh, and this is also what I like to emphasize that uh, we need to pay attention put attention on a uh, geological uh, type of disaster as well, such as a uh, volcanic eruption, earthquakes and tsunami, uh, tsunami and so on and so forth. And um, the third one, I think uh, I also like to commend both of you because uh, both of you bring up uh, indigenous knowledge, uh, local wisdom uh, in Lombok. I, I, no I noted that. And uh, you mentioned that uh, Southeast Asia deserves um, producer, knowledge producers. I, I totally agree with that. However, I think, uh, I, I don't know, I, I feel that the, the case study of Lombok, uh, particularly the, the, uh, the rice barns in Lombok, I think it's too micro because I think um, uh, you, you also have another example, good example, for example, Bali uh, as a province. I think uh, Bali has, um, you know, a theme um, for their recovery, uh, call it as Nangun Sat Kirti Loka. It means that uh, securing uh, the authenticity, the originality of Balinese way of life, it encompasses a lot of uh, aspects. Um, including the climate change uh, and environment. Uh, and I think it, it is worth uh, to, to look at because um, I think during the COVID-19, the governor of Bali, for example, uh, issuing a lot of regulations, including protecting water reservation and also, for example, prohibiting the single use plastic and also uh, other, um, among other things. So I, I think this needs uh, to, uh, to look at uh, further. And then the second one, I think when we talk about Southeast Asia, one thing that probably um, uh, need to be uh, brought up is actually the role of faith-based uh, organizations such as Nadatul Ulama, Muhammadiyah, and also in the Philippines, for example, uh, Charitas, uh, the, uh, the Charitas Church Foundation and so on and so forth. I, and I think I haven't really heard about that. And then the, the fourth one and the, the last one probably, uh, uh, when we talk about urban, I think, yes, I, I think uh, in Southeast Asia, we already have uh, had the, the platform called ASEAN Smart Cities Network. Uh, it connects um, cities across the region. And I think uh, th this needs to be elaborated for there because it is very uh, potential um, with regard to the recovery after the pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much um, uh, for those comments. Uh, we then move on to Sulfikar Amir uh, from Nanyang Technological University. Please go ahead, Sulfikar. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer for inviting me. So this is a fascinating uh, session, I think, uh, and it touched a lot of dimensions uh, regarding uh, pandemic uh, responses in Southeast Asia. Now, the first paper from uh, Monica and uh, and and 
and Thomas, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I found this very fascinating in terms of understanding you know, resilience in the age of pandemic. And I really like the way, you know, uh, resilient here, especially more specifically social resilience uh, is explored. Uh, but I was wondering whether we should, uh, you know, frame the concept of resilience in a slightly different way because we're dealing with a kind of crisis that that is quite distinctive, that is quite different from conventional, you know, uh, disasters and crises that have been uh, uh, studied uh, uh, by uh, resilient researchers. So when we talk about resilience, like you know, Monica explained, uh, it, it, it refers to the ability to bounce back. But I was wondering, uh, uh, but I think in, in the pandemic crisis, we should redefine resilience as something uh, that that emerge not after the crisis is over, but during the crisis, because we, we, we're talking about a crisis that has a different topology, which is a, a very much like a slow burning you know, crisis. This is something that, that is taking you know, very long. So we cannot wait until the, the pandemic is over uh, to talk about resilience. We have to look at you know, how people respond directly to the infection cases, to the spread of virus. So our conversation about resilience should be directly, you know, anchored toward, uh, 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 you know, the ability of, of the people, of the institutions, of the government in responding to the uh, crisis. So I think, you know, that's my, my highlight uh, for the, the first presentation, uh, but also just a short uh, comments on the urban, uh, you know, uh, urban context. Yes, it is true that uh, when we look at, you know, what's going on or what has been happening with the pandemic, we, uh, we can, you know, uh, we all can agree that basically the pandemic has a, a higher level of, 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 of crisis uh, uh, that, is, uh, that, that is happening in, in the urban environments. So, uh, uh, and, and there is a very much a strong correlations between infection, the number of infection cases and a population density in urban areas. So we need to look at, you know, urban or the cities as the epicenter of the pandemic. Uh, uh, and, and I think it will be interesting to see or to examine you know, the impact of lockdown, because lockdown has been very much uh, a widely practiced uh, uh, mitigation uh, carried out uh, by uh, cities across the world. Uh, but then, of course, the manifestation and implementation of lockdown is different uh, in a various across cities. So it will be interesting to see, you know, how lockdowns have, imp have different uh, impacts on, on cities. Now, I'm particularly interested with the second presentation from uh, Philips, uh, and you know I really appreciate the way you know uh, Dr. Fermonte described the the current situation in Indonesia. We know that Indonesia is uh, currently is the worst uh, country in terms of responding to the pandemic uh, uh, crisis in Southeast Asia. Uh, but one thing that I would like to uh, to note here that Indonesia, I, I mean. The, the reason why Indonesia is failing to properly respond to the pandemic crisis is not because Indonesia is lacking infrastructure, okay? Indonesia has adequate health infrastructures and it has put into work a regulatory framework uh, uh, to combat pandemic. So it has the regulation, it has the infrastructures and Indonesia has enough number of competent public health and medical experts. The Ministry of Health in uh, Indonesia Ministry of Health is one of the is one of the the the, the best minister uh, ministries in terms of you know our main power in terms of uh, uh, qualified you know experts, but why the pandemic mitigations flop in Indonesia? And I think in my analysis, it's it's rooted in in uh, more in the political and economic interests. Okay. Uh, so I just want to say that the problem with Indonesia is basically 
uh, is because the mitigation plan has been hijacked by the, the, the political and economic interests by the political and economic elites that render the mitigations to be you know, uh, ineffective. And this, this has been happening since the pandemic start in uh, February uh, last year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we then move on to our third and final discussant. Vanare Chiang from the Asian Vision Institute in Cambodia. Um, please go ahead, Vanare. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you, the organizer, for the opportunities. It, it has been a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, comment on the papers from on Vietnam and, and Cambodia because I'm more familiar with mainland Southeast Asia. Um, I think uh, uh, Dr. Andrew has provided us very interesting a uh, kind of uh, uh, illustration on the role of leadership and governance uh, in uh, responding to a pandemic crisis, of which I think that that is the most important. It's about leadership and governance. We, we may have a uh, different varying degree of resources and infrastructure, but I think uh, without the leadership, uh, it will not uh, address, uh, cannot address the, 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 this kind of crisis. And uh, the finding from the factory workers by um, uh, Takanyo Th also very interesting. I think it, it kind of in line with uh, the global uh, analysis of, I mean, uh, like the World Bank and IMF and others uh, organization with regards to the impacts on, on the COVID-19 on, on the factory workers' income. So the female worker tend to be more vulnerable and the low income tend to be more vulnerable than, than uh, the high incomes and the more uh, educated and uh, the, the men. Um, so I, I agree with uh, all those uh, findings and arguments, but I would be appreciated or, or, or if uh, can add a bit more on how Vietnam could control the border with China because you share a long border with China and uh, uh, you could manage the, the flow uh, of the, the virus and uh, uh, human movement very effectively. Uh, of course, perhaps at the expense of diplomatic relationship and political trust with China, but at least you, you could manage uh, and control the situation very well, uh, including um, uh, the border with Cambodia. We had a certain kind of tension uh, uh, in March in particular uh, because of uh, the sudden uh, border closure imposed by the Vietnamese side and the Vietnamese uh, in uh, a setting of a uh, a kind of uh, um, a camps, a small camp, a small uh, military unit along the border to monitor the people movement across the border. Uh, on Cambodian case, uh, very interesting to listen to uh, the presentation by uh, Professor Walker with the different dimension of the response. Um, I just would like to add, uh, I mean, comparative uh, analysts and uh, to, to Vietnam, I think political leadership in Cambodia also counts a lot in uh, this uh, uh, pandemic prevention and, mit uh, uh, and mitigation. Um, because the old course Hun Sen is a, a strong Australian leader, uh, very decisive leadership. So he's the one who really, you know, uh, uh, take the very swift uh, decision and actions uh, early on uh, against uh, the pandemic. And he could mobilize uh, the resources from the public and pub private and individual um, citizens uh, to mobilize financial resources uh, in response to the pandemic and also social trust. So actually, uh, so this COVID-19 is opportunity for him to strengthen uh, the regime legitimacy that have been under question uh, after the election 2018. So this is opportunity for regime legitimacy or uh, uh, enhancement of the uh, Hun Sen uh, administration, so um, that uh, that is kind of a plus to to the political uh, legitimacy of Hun Sen in uh, dealing with the crisis. When it comes to the oppressing the opposition, yes, to some degree, uh, that uh, the opposition members have been suppressed under, uh, I mean, during this COVID nineteen. But the, the the overall picture is to how to say to reduce the uh, political fronts. So the political front now is COVID-19. So to uh, kind of eliminate another political front when it comes to human rights, democracy, and so on, and the uh, uh, sanction by the European Union and the United States. 
So that is quite quite complex when it comes to a political dimension of the COVID-19. Uh, to all political dimension, you are correctly accused that uh, China uh, yes, has gained more advantage and leverage on Cambodia when it comes to uh, the Chinese influence and so power in Cambodia and the Mekong region in general. So, so I would like to end here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our discussants. Um, we have a few questions in the Q and A um, feed here. Um, they, some of them that I'd like to pick up first on here concern uh, the question of vaccinations and 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 so far the challenge of COVID has related to sort of the outbreak of the pandemic in much of our discussion, but certainly in Europe, the COVID-19 challenge now is uh, perceived in large part as a matter of getting vaccines into the arms of, of the citizenry. And, and I would like to ask um, the panelists um, who might have thoughts on this, whether or not, um, whether the vaccines will be a game changer and as much of a political uh, priority in, in, in the societies that you have studied and whether the same patterns, uh, political strengths and weaknesses, cultural uh, uh, factors and so on and so forth will impact the vaccination story, which is I expect to be evolving over the coming year or so. Um, Philips, would you like to start? Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Thomas. And uh, yeah, I saw a very specific question on Indonesia on the, on the vaccine. <clears throat> and uh, uh, my opinion is this, uh, vaccine, oh, as our health uh, minister <clears throat> already stated a few days ago, that it, it would take three years for Indonesia to get the people vaccinated. With 250 million something people, uh, of course, that, that will be a, a very difficult uh, process for, for the Indonesian government to, to vaccine uh, to all the people. So now uh, Indonesia is uh, 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 getting vaccine from Sinovac and uh, 3 million doses already arrived. And uh, if we assume that uh, that would be used twice for, for a person, then uh, only 1.5 million you know, uh, people uh, will get vaccinated in the next three months. And then the, that's only a fraction of Indonesian 250 million people. So what I'm saying is that uh, it is uh, dangerous for the government to provide narrative that vaccine is the ultimate uh, game changer because there are other things that the Indonesian governments and the Indonesian people needs to continue uh, to be doing. You know, all this, the social distancing, uh, restricting people movement, uh, you wearing face masks and so on and so forth. So. I would say that uh, it will be remiss if we just uh, put our bet on the vaccine. And then the, the one that we have is actually, you know, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, the efficacy questions, the scientific uh, evidence, uh, you know, is, is coming very slow. So I think the government needs to, to continue trying to do the, the other health protocols, strict measures. And then the, I think uh, there's also a question about the similarity between Indonesia. All right, I, I stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much. Uh, would any of the other panelists like to comment on the question of vaccines in, in their respective, uh, the countries that they have studied? And then do cities play a role here? Uh, uh, for example, Monica, do you have anything or Tomas? Andrew, or Totakan, no? All right. Then we move on to... to, to I, I can... Andrew, may, may I ask a question? Yes, of course. Yes. No, I mean, we have the discussion here in Europe about uh, uh, different um, um, categories or kinds of vaccine. A vaccine, you know, that is uh, um, DNA-based or, you know, uh, the, Germany, uh, developed in Germany and the US uh, um, by BioNTech and uh, Pfizer and uh, the other, the vector-based, the traditional uh, kinds of vaccine uh, like uh, the Sputnik in Russia. Is there a discussion in Southeast Asia about uh, what kind of vaccine uh, um, would be most appropriate um, for their respective societies? Uh, I mean, uh, um, 
or I mean, uh, whether uh, to what extent uh, uh, the vaccine, uh, um, which we actually, <laughs> which we, uh, which has developed in a very short time, within a very few months, uh, um, um, uh, has uh, could also have negative impact, you know, for uh, those who uh, get this vaccine when compared to, to the danger of being uh, exposed to, to the virus. Uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, in Europe, it's clear that, uh, um, for instance, Germany, 80% uh, of uh, the deaths uh, um, by coronavirus uh, actually are in the age group 80 plus. So the, um, the probability uh, that, sorry, sorry? Yeah, uh, that- uh, your question. Yeah, no, the question is uh, uh, to what extent uh, there is a discussion in the uh, Southeast Asian countries about uh, um, um, the feasibility of uh, getting uh, vaccines and uh, uh, what kind of vaccine should be then uh, used for their respective populations. Thank you, Volker. Uh, one, 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 one factor that is certainly um, part of the discussion in, in, in Europe and also in North America is, is the role of so-called anti-vaccine movements, right? Um, uh, social and political movements that are trying to, to, to stop the vaccine rollout. Um, and I'm not aware uh, if there's anything similar to that in, 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 in Southeast Asia at the moment. Um, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on this. Uh, I, I can I can give my my answer to the question of vaccine in in Vietnam. Uh, in, in Vietnam, we try to diversify the sorts of vaccine for for the people. Uh, according to the government, they uh, they are trying to find the vaccine from the United States, Europe, and also from Russia, but they don't mention any anything about the China. I don't know. Because maybe if they buy the vaccine from China, no one will use it. Maybe because you know that's a history between Vietnam and, and China, uh, and 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 also one important source of the vaccine is uh, Vietnam. is trying to produce a vaccine by ourselves. Uh, now, uh, as, uh, last month, they already asked for volunteer to to test on human. Uh, about 50 people volunteer to, to test on, on the vaccine produced by Vietnam. And we hope that we can have the vaccine by, by March at the, at the earliest, but maybe in, in, in May. But uh, uh, according to the, from, the, the, from the government, uh, as the latest news from government last week, uh, the Prime Minister uh, say that, uh, said that uh, uh, we will continue to close the border and we, we don't think that we will have the vaccine for all the people by the end of 2021, it means this year. So, uh, so that means that we can anticipate about the situation for vaccine in Vietnam. Uh, now I, 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 I try to uh, answer the question uh, raised by Vanarit from Cambodia about the border, control the border between Vietnam and China, because uh, we have a land border with only three countries, uh, China, Laos, uh, and, and Cambodia. But you can see that from the map that it, it, it very long, more than 2,000 um, yeah, uh, kilometers from, 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 from China to, to Cambodia. And it's, a, it's really, it's a big uh, challenge for us to control the border yeah, in this. Uh, we, uh, as Vanerit mentioned, that we have to establish uh, many small camps uh, along the border to control uh, illegal migrants. Uh, because of the many important cases uh, so far from uh, Europe or from the United States, it's very easy for us to control because we have a 15, uh, the policy of 15 days uh, quarantine in hotel or military camp. And also another 15, uh, 15 days after, after leaving the hotel, they have to quarantine at home for, for two weeks more. So already uh, one month. So, so it's very easy for us to, to try and control. But for uh, illegal uh, immigration from, from China, uh, it's it really a problem because many people, uh, Vietnamese people migrate to China to work and also to, to Thailand to work. And also, so they, 
during near, now now is in uh, near the near the, near the, the, the new year the new year uh, they, they they will come some five come back to to enjoy the, the new year with their family so uh I, I read on the newspaper that in in, in two days they arrest about 500 people uh immig uh, illegally uh migrate immigrated from 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 china and and and, and from also from cambodia so uh yeah, it, it really is challenging for us. But uh, uh, na, last uh, two weeks ago, the, the government go, go, yeah, so go, go for people to, to rebuild uh, illegally uh, migrants. Uh, so uh, we, we hope that it, 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 uh, it will work for, for the policy. OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Khan. Um, it is time to, for us to, to wrap up here. I'm afraid we are coming to the very end of, of, of our session. There's a number of uh, additional issues that we'll have to, to discuss in, um, in, uh, in further conversations regarding the impact and role of regimes, for example, political regimes, and also um, questions surrounding foreign policy. Uh, and I'm sure that social scientists and and humanities scholars will continue to, to, to work on these questions in the years, indeed decades ahead. Um, but I'd like now to, to, to move them towards the concluding uh, remarks uh, and uh, hand over or back again to, to Andrew Hardy, the crisis project coordinator. Please, Andrew. Thank you, uh, thank you, Thomas. Um, uh, what a what a fascinating afternoon, morning. Uh, uh, just a few hours, a couple of hours, but we've covered a lot of ground, um, and uh, in many ways we've uh, scratched the surface, or barely scratched the surface. But uh, the study of COVID nineteen is, uh, uh, as we all know, it just in its very early days, and. Uh, we also see from today's discussion how fast it's moving because uh, your questions, uh, particularly from uh, colleagues based in Europe, have been about the vaccine. Uh, but the vaccine didn't come up in most of the papers, which are still dealing with, you know, we're, we're doing research on what was going on in 2020. Um, I will take this opportunity to reply to a couple of questions that were sent in on the Q&A. Uh, session, particularly uh, uh, Tida Tun, who's uh, very interesting comments about uh, centralization and, and aggressive responses. I don't think centralization is uh, a centralized response is, uh, is a particularly important part of the issue. Uh, and I think that goes the same, uh, goes, goes, goes also for, uh, uh, for the, the regime type. The, the key in the Vietnamese case has been the type of response, a very, very aggressive and single-minded response. Um, and I think that's probably the case in Taiwan and in New Zealand and elsewhere, where, uh, you know, very aggressive uh, uh, response were uh, successfully operated by democratic regimes. So it's, uh, so it's not a, a, an issue of, of regime type really here. It's more the aggressiveness and the single-mindedness of, of the response and the lack of a dilemma between the economic imperative and the, uh, uh, and the uh, health imperative. In any case, um, uh, we have to now conclude. Um, my thanks go to, in particular, to all the researchers, both those of you presenting today uh, and to those who contributed research uh, that was presented today. Thank you uh, to all of you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, most of the uh, research is available, most of the research presented today is available in the form of policy briefs that are on the uh, website of the CRISI project. Um, thanks too to the, uh, to the discussants for your very interesting uh, uh, comments. Um, the crisis project is coming to an end. It will it will conclude in just a couple of months' time. We will hold our final conference in a similar format to today's meeting in the last week of February. Um, there will be some uh, coronavirus-related content, 
so if you're interested in, in, in both the issue of the COVID-19 and in the project's main theme, which is competing regional integrations in Southeast Asia, then uh, do join us then. And my final thank you, which is a repeated thank you, will be to the organizers of this meeting, of course, uh, at the CSIS. And I hand over now to uh, Medelina, who will uh, close the session for us. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for the screen and giving me the opportunity to close the two days uh, session uh, workshop. Um, uh, Andrew Hardy, uh, Zax, Elizabeth, Eves, uh, Phillips, all panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning or good uh, afternoon, uh, depending on where you are located. Uh, CSIS Indonesia is honored to have co-hosted the crisis dissemination workshop with the consortium. I think we have had quite fruitful discussion in the last two days. This uh, dissemination workshop has served as a means of knowledge exchange and knowledge sharing. More importantly, it has identified some concerning and important issues around ASEAN centrality and COVID-19 that have a policy implication in the region that need to be further uh, researched and uh, highlighted. Uh, it is admittedly unfortunate that uh, we still could not convene uh, through physical means uh, due to the current state of uh, global public health. However, I believe that uh, this digital format also yield uh, new opportunities for us to engage with stakeholders and the public and disseminate our research results as much as broader range uh, throughout Southeast Asia, Europe, and uh, beyond. I just uh, checked the YouTube that, um, uh, for example, yesterday a session has been viewed by uh, uh, more uh, 300 viewers, uh, both through YouTube and also uh, through uh, Zoom. If, I need to, uh, if anything, I would argue that the dissemination effort through digital means is uh, much efficient now, given that the traditional boundaries of time and place have disappeared. As a research institution, CSIS has been uh, involved in the crisis consortium since the start of the project three years ago. In the research effort within Work Package 4, we offered a perspective on Southeast Asia generational configuration to support Southeast Asian integration and identity. Within Work, work Package uh, 5, we conducted research on ASEAN relation with its dialogue partner. Apart from that, we are also facilitating the dissemination efforts of the project to the broader audience. Throughout our uh, 50 years of policy advisory experience, interdisciplinarity and regional issues have always been at CSIS heart, making CRISI a fitting platform to enhance cooperation within and beyond the region. On that note, I believe that CRISI is an example of research consortium that reaps the benefit of diversity. Diverse in terms of uh, the research theme and its researchers with cross-disciplinary background. Those diversities enables the consortium with consists of 13 institutions from different countries in Europe and Southeast Asia to produce holistic and intertwining research deliverables, further connecting the policy discussion between Southeast Asia, Europe, and its respective regional organization frameworks. As the global pandemic has taught us, interregional cooperation and all fronts is needed now more than ever. On behalf of CSIS Indonesia, first, first of all, I want to thank the project management team at CRISI, Andrew Hardy as project coordinator, and Zach, Elizabeth, and Yves for the consortium productive relationship in the past three years, and for creating possibility where each of us could contribute it best. I would also like congratulate Crisi, a researcher, for our collective productivity amidst the changing times. I'm hopeful that we can continue our collaboration 
in the future with our established network of scholars with an avid interest in Southeast Asia. Once again, the pandemic has somewhat disrupted the region throughout many aspects. We are still in the middle of that process and the outcome of sub, such di disruption remains to be seen in the future. In that, I believe that there are potential for further examination of what will become of Southeast Asia and its quest for a further regional integration after a major, after a major multidimensional crisis. Finally, in this opportunity, I would like to send my sincere gratitude and thanks to Dr. Philip Fermonte, CSIS Executive Director, who gave full support to the CSIS team to involve in the Croatia project. Special thanks to the organizer at CSIS, Fifi and Rumantong and the Knowledge Management Team led by Belfazar for organizing this virtual workshop. And last but not least, thank you to all the attendants and participants who have joined the discussion on Zoom and YouTube in these two days. And with that, I give uh, the floor back to Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madalena. Well, that wraps up our workshop. Thank you all for joining us. And if I may, I invite you to clap your hands a little bit as uh, appreciation for the organizers and the panelists. A virtual thank you.